Chers auditeurs, Dear listeners, bonjour. Welcome in Comdarchi Podcast Season 4. Saison 4 dans le monde fascinant des architectes. And in the architectural projects. Je suis Anne-Charlotte de Ponte, passionnée d'architecture et docteur des universités en histoire de l'archi. I am one of the spokespersons of Anne Charlotte, who is a PhD in architecture history. Merci. Thank you. D'être avec moi aujourd'hui. To be with us today. Et and maintenant, now, lundi en français, place au talent. And Wednesday, let's talk projects. In English, of course. Bienvenue dans Comme d'Archie. Dear listeners, good morning. This is Esther on behalf of Anne Charlotte. It's good to meet you again in season 4 of Comme d'Archie, episode 35. Today, we are happy to present the first part of our mini series, Small Theatrical Epic in the West. The broadcasting of the architects' interviews will resume in January. Indeed, Anne Charlotte has decided to take time off for the holidays. While waiting on her return and to honor the Monday and Wednesday rendezvous, she has concocted this series entitled Small Theatrical Epic. However, you will be able to find the interviews of architects during the Friday reruns, which continue. For this Christmas period, Anne Charlotte hesitated a lot. Logically, she will take you to places of worship, our ancient and fabulous churches, a subject to reconnect with our roots by retaining the best, the charitable work and the divine impulse. All in all, values transverse to any civilization. Or we can take you to other countries, but that the natives will know much better. Or should we consider our secular palaces to be sure to please all? Sigh of our Christian values, we Westerners, since our time wants us rascal. Tonnerre de Brest, by thunder. Or finally, should we take you in merry hemicycles? Not that of the French National Assembly, where the human comedy is being played at the moment. Some may say overplayed or badly played, giving more desire to flee than anything else. No, the hemicycles of the theater, a reflection of ourselves, for better or for worse, but positive when we want it, pushing the reflection to whoever wants to see. Besides, in Europe, and by extension, apart from the debauchery of gifts, which doesn't really interest Anne Charlotte, isn't Christmas the time of rediscovered pleasure in the middle of the humid and cold winter? This time for the family? Adopted, extended or nuclear, reconstituted. What joy when it exists, how warmed are the hearts. And above all, for Anne Charlotte, far but very far from the madness of men that makes the cannon roar at our doors or locks the woman in a kind of a shroud. And, dear Balzac, you would enjoy today this new and ridiculous register of the Comédie Humaine, wouldn't you? unless you end up losing yourself in so many convolutions and other twists proper to an era deprived of its cardinal points. They are confiscated. The comedy, we said. Precisely its representation, where does it come from? Let's open this part one in the antiquity. Did you know that the ancient origin of the theater in the West was linked to religious rituals? Because from 545 BC, plays were performed in Athens during the Great Dionysus, festivities in honor of Dionysus, god of the vine, of wine, of madness and excess. The city-state initiates and manages these spectacles. It chooses playwrights, it helps with the financing of the spectacle. Moreover, the poets and the actors receive a salary. It is also the city-state which allows the poorest to attend the representations. Greek tragedy reached its peak in the 5th century BC while comedy was born in 486 BC during the Great Dionysia. It seemed that this last one is resulting from the comic games improvised during the phallic processions in the honor of Dionysos. The religion is then, and without any measure compared to our morals, completely disinhibited. 
the permanent stone theatres were built only after the 4th century BC, after the period of the so-called classical theatre. The open-air theatres seem to be designed to accommodate an orchestra corresponding to a flat circular space reserved for the chorus. It is at the bottom of a raised stage for the actors, as well as a row of semicircular bleachers built on the hillside around the orchestra. These theatres could accommodate up to 20,000 spectators. Gradually, their stage became larger and encroached on the space reserved for the orchestra. The actors, only men, mostly wore ordinary clothes, sometimes suits, but also masks larger than their faces, allowing them to be distinguished and indicating the nature of their character. The dimensions of these theatres forbid any subtle effect and impose an organized, rigid movement as well as a strong voice. Music and dances are part of the show. This show is probably more similar to opera than modern theatre. Ancient Rome also loved the show. It is influenced by Greece, of course. From the 4th century BC, the Roman theatre became very important. At the beginning of the empire, the Romans had the right to two days of theatre per year. At the end of the empire, they were entitled to 55 days of theatre and circus per year. The Roman theatre, called Ludicianisi, scenic games, took its importance in 364 BC, when dancers and musicians from Etruria presented a show in front of a Sina stage wall. Around 240 BC, Lucius Livius Andronicus inaugurated the Greek games by translating and representing Greek comedies and tragedies. As in Greece, the buildings intended for the theatre appear only after the end of the classical period, towards the first century BC. Roman architecture allowed the construction of autonomous theatres, whereas the Greeks used natural slopes and hillsides to support the tiers. The choir having become almost insignificant, the orchestra is reduced to form only a tiny semicircle. Most of the Roman comedies have as a frame a street in front of three houses. The stage, extending on nearly 30 meters wide, is provided with a façade with three sides and three doors. Note the two designs. The Greek theatre and the Roman theatre differ at the cavia, where the spectators are seated. The Greek theatre follows the radiating line, while the Roman theatre cuts the cavia in a rectilinear way in the same plane as the stage. Unlike the ancient Greek theatre, the Roman theatre is mostly a closed building. While the Greek theatre offers spectators a view of the surrounding landscape behind the stage, a stage wall closes the Roman theatre and rises to the same height as the cavia. In the 1st century BC, the great Roman architectural expert, Vitruvius, implied that his predecessors knew very precisely how to design a theatre for the human voice. According to the rules of mathematics and the methods of music, he writes and adds, they knew how to make the voices coming from the stage reach the ears of the spectators more distinctly and pleasantly by designing theatres according to the laws of science of harmony. The ancients have increased the power of the voice. End of quote. The answer will come from the laws of physics of wave diffraction by stepped surfaces. It has been established for several years that this type of surface can indeed accentuate certain frequencies and attenuate others as, for example, the case of the microscopic undulations on the wings of a butterfly, which strongly reflect certain colors. What could be more durable than these stone theatres whose remains are still remarkably preserved? What could be more remarkable than the ancient Greek theatre of Epidaurus? The theatre, which was discovered under the soil of the Peloponnese Peninsula in 1881, has the classic semicircular shape of Greek amphitheatres, with 34 rows of stone seats, to which the Romans added 21 rows. The acoustics are extraordinary. An actor on the stage, in the open air, can be heard in the back row at a distance of almost 60 meters. Dear listeners, 
we wish you happy holidays and hope you will be serene and supported. We send special thoughts to those who are alone. As always, thank you for tuning in. Let's meet again next week for a new Kamdashi in English. And until then, take care of yourselves. Goodbye. Thank you for listening. Thanks to Julien Robourg, sound engineer, who is collaborating with us today. Don't forget to tune in to our previews on Instagram at Comdarchi Podcast. If you enjoy this podcast, don't hesitate to promote it by giving it five stars and a little comment on Apple Podcast or on your favorite podcast platform. And above all, subscribe to listen to all of our episodes for free. See you soon. And until then, take care of yourself.